What do um, skeletal muscles have that smooth do not? Striations. Striations? Mm hmm. That's a short list. And? How many nuclei? More than two. More than two. Multinucleation. Lots. Where are the nuclei located? On the outside. On the edge. Yeah, most cells it's in the middle. These are just under the sarcolemma. About size. Long cylindrical. Skeletal muscle, long cylindrical. As long as the muscle belly is. What's the name of the um, embryonic stem cells that fuse together to form those giant myocytes? Myo something. Satellite cells are the stem cells retained in the adult um, skeletal muscle cells in the endomysium. Myoblast. Blast forming myo muscle. Common term for a stem cell that gives rise to a particular type of cell blast. What do you think an erythroblast forms? An erythrocyte, red blood cell. Yeah, so you see blast over and over again. What do cardiac muscle cells have that smooth don't? Um, they're both striated. They're in. They're so cardiac involun involuntary. Control is different. Cardiac's involuntary, skeletal is voluntary. <clears throat> Gap junctions at uh, junction sites called. What are the gap junctions inside of? A bigger junction that has gap and desmosome. Intercalated discs. Long and cylindrical or short and fat? Long. Cardiac. Short and fat. Branch or no branch? Branch. They branch. <coughs> Connected tissue around the muscle belly. Type is dense irregular. Name is? Endo. Epimesium. Around the fascicle. Type is fibrous again. <clears throat> Name paramecium. Around the myofibers. Type. Areolar. Name. Endomesium. What do those connective tissues do? Functions. Connect all the name helps you. Yeah, connect. Connects all the muscle cells and fibers so that when just a few shorten, all the muscle fibers and fascicles shorten. And at the ends of the muscle belly, the connective tissue fibers continue and they form yeah. tendons, which is what type of tissue? Mm, dense. Dense. dense regular. <clears throat> so, which, which ones um, protect again? If there's so not to signal all everything at once, is it all the epimesium and perineum? endo? Only endo? Mm -hmm. okay. Isolating fibers from each other, electrically separating them. What else do you find in endomesium besides connective tissue fibers? Blood vessels, nerve fibers. And the stem cells called satellite cells, or myosatellite cells. Function of myosatellite cells? Repair of damaged muscle fibers. So you could say a muscle belly and cross section is a bundle of Fascicle and a fascicle cutting cross section. You see a bundle of muscle fibers 
and you cut through a muscle fiber and cross section, you see a bundle of myofibrils. <coughs> myofibrils. Cut through myofibril and cross section, you see a bunch of filaments. Myofilaments. Namely, thick and thin. <coughs> about some features of <coughs> sarcoplasm. Some of them are unique to sarcoplasm. Some are things that other cells have, but the sarcoplasm has a lot of them. Features. Lots of mitochondria. Myoglobin. Glycosome. Tubules. Uh -huh. Sarcoplasmic reticulum, which has the terminal cisterna. What is the SR, a modified version of? Endoplasmic reticulum. <coughs> What do you call the region where you have only overlapping thick filaments? No thin. Age zone. Overlapping thin, no thick. I band. Overlapping thin and thick. A band. Name of uh, proteins that form M line. Myomycin. Name of proteins that form Z disk. Alpha actinin. Alpha actinin. Name of protein that forms thick filament. Myosin. Myosin. Name of protein that forms most of the thin filament. Actin. Actin. And the subunits of filamentous actin are G actin. G stands for globular. Small globular protein. Feature, features of a G actin. What do you find on each G actin? Myosin binding set. What do you find on each myosin head? Actin binding site and ATPase. And there's ATPases associated with lots of different proteins. So these ones are called myosin ATPases. How is the myosin ATPase different in a fast twitch fiber compared to a slow? What does it do differently? It's the reason fast twitch or fast. Yeah? Raj, I think you've got it. Because of the attachment of the head. And then it has, once it's attached, then it breaks, hydrolyzes. Then it so when the ATP binds to the myosin head, what happens first? It's detached. Detach, and then? It's go back. Because hydrolyzed by Hydrolyzed, it. and then the energy released from hydrolysis re-energizes the myosin head. So a faster version of myosin ATPase causes detachment re-energization re faster so that you can have faster cross recycling. More power strokes per second. So you can shorten a greater distance per second. So, so you, get a, you get a greater velocity because of that. So yeah, it's a faster version of myosin ATPase. Hmm. Slow twitch have a slower ATPase, fast twitch have a faster ATPase. Same enzyme, just works at different speeds. And that, that's from chapter, or that's from chapter 9, but at the end. So Monday, Wednesday, hasn't seen that yet. Um, what else do you find in a thin filament? Um, <coughs> Nebulin is a structural protein that the F-actin is wrapped around, and so thin filament's got everything, structural protein, contractile protein, 
regulatory. So what are the regulatory? Mm -hmm. Troponin. Troponin and tropomyosin. About, about how long is a tropomyosin molecule? Seven G. About 7 G actin in length. So every 7 G actin along the strand of F actin, you've got one troponin and one tropomyosin. So it's not one tropomyosin for that whole thin filament. It's lots and lots of them. And remember, they don't all move at the same time. That's why tension goes up gradually, not instantaneously. How about the subunits of troponin? And what they bind to? TNC binds to calcium. No? No. Binds to TNI binds to actin and TNT. So troponin's got a hand on actin, connecting it to actin, to the thin filament. It's got a hand on tropomyosin, and then it's got a binding site for calcium. Calcium binds, then what happens to troponin? Changes shape. Doesn't pull the actin, it pulls the tropomyosin. Moves it away from the myosin binding sites on actin. Or you could say it moves away from its inhibitory position. <clears throat> What's it called when uh, myosin head is bound to thin filament? Or myosin head is bound to actin? It's called a cross bridge. What are the components of a triad? 1 T tubule, 2 terminal cisternae. Function of terminal cisternae? Release the calcium. Release calcium. So you, you can get a little. The, the work's divvied up a little. So the, the SR is the whole thing. The end portions is where most of the release channels are, and that's where release begins when the T-tubule proteins open the, the release channels. And then most of the pumps are in the middle of the SR, so not the terminal cisterna. So there's a little bit of a division of labor. As a whole, it, it is storage and release of calcium. That's the job of the SR in general. But terminal cisterna is more release, middle of the SR is more storage pumping. And what do you call those transporters that pump calcium back into the SR? The pumps. Calcium pumps, calcium pumps or? Uh, it's that term you often see associated with a primary active transporter. Calcium ATPases. Calcium ATPases. Sodium potassium pump is also called sodium potassium ATP. So that name tells you it's a pump. It's a primary active transporter. It uses ATP. As the sarcomere shortens, what happens to A band? It, it moves, but it doesn't. It moves, um, stays the same. It moves position, but it stays the same length. No, no change in the width. And in a way, everything ends up moving in the end because the whole myofibril shortens. But if you are looking at just one sarcomere, as the Z lines approach the thick filament, it doesn't look like the, the thick filaments, thus the A band are, are moving at all. It just looks like the I bands are shortened. These things are connected end to end along the, the whole length of the myofibril. So everything's moving inward. So while A band stays the same, meaning the width doesn't change, H zone and I band decrease in width may disappear. <coughs> maximal shortening, they both disappear, they're gone. How 
requires skeletal muscle stimulated to contract. In a phrase, in a nutshell, without getting into all the steps, how's a muscle cell stimulated to contract? The motor or neuron sends a nerve. Traction control travels down the motor neuron. The AP. Stimulated by a motor neuron. Motor neuron. That's just summed up. Skeletal muscle cells are stimulated to contract when they're stimulated by a motor neuron. And then when you explain what stimulation involves, that's the events of the NMJ. So this illustration represents all phases, the whole process of muscle contraction from signals, APs coming down, motor neuron, to muscle shortening. Everything's here, visually. And then your job is to explain events at NMJ, events of EC coupling, events of cross root cycling, and, and finally, the sliding filament mechanism. So if you're starting at the top, APs travel down alpha motor neuron. You don't have to call it alpha. I think I might have put that term on your study guide. Motor neurons fine. So what does that cause to happen? And I'll just process arrow, process arrow, cause and effect. Stimulates, triggers, opening of voltage gated calcium channels. open an ion channel, the next thing you, you need to say is what goes through it. So what goes through the direction and the force causing it to go through. So calcium enters axon terminal, moving down it's electrochemical gradient. That triggers mobilization of, you can call them synaptic vesicles, or neurotransmitter vesicles. Mobilization of synaptic vesicles, which move toward and fuse with presynaptic membrane. He's having issues. I gotta help him out. Like I said before, every time I do this, it comes out a little different. The wording, the number of steps, how I break it up. Yeah? Can you add the Kind of. I'll talk about it. I don't know that I'll write it all down because there's a lot, but yeah. Is this fused with blood at the very end? Fused with presynaptic membrane. Resulting in, there we go. What's the process? Exocytosis. Exocytosis. <coughs> uh, acetylcholine. There we go. We 
which diffuses across the synaptic cleft. ACH binds to ACH receptors. On the, I'll just put both, post synaptic membrane called the motor end plate. MEP. And this triggers opening. Ligand gated. Non selective. Non Add ion channel. And this results in sodium influx. And I'll just put at this point um, moving down its EC gradient. Potassium efflux. Also moving down its EC gradient. Sodium influx is greater than much greater than potassium efflux. Resulting in depolarization. Resulting in a graded potential. EPP spreads or reaches, do reaches, EPP reaches the sarcolemma around the motor implant, triggering the opening of Not just sodium channel, voltage gated sodium channels. So that's a good spot to end and say that is events at the NMJ. Right?
because the job of the neuromuscular junction is to get the sarcolemma depolarized. So we're, we're ending with that. I have a question. Do you, is, it, is it necessary to talk, like in that last step, do you have to indicate if it's a selective or non-selective channel? When you call it a sodium channel, that tells you it's selective. So that, that's just kind of default. If we're not calling it a particular ion, sodium channel, calcium channel, potassium channel, then it's not selective. But if it's multiple ions, then it's then it's non-selective as well. Right. So would you have to write that non-selective in your step? In any of those steps, if it were to occur? Yeah, if multiple ions were going through, you'd want to indicate that. Okay. Um, what could you add? I don't know. What can we add to that? Jane? I don't know. That's why I asked you for the What do you think? You already added one. Nice. Very nice. That's really nice. The graded, uh, graded potential is one. Is a little extra because you could just say resulting in an EP. And then if you were to describe what a graded potential is, you would say graded potentials, like what's different? Um, it doesn't last long, it just goes in waves. And, then it's and why is it called graded? Because it can be large and small. So graded potentials vary in size and they decay over distance. Action potentials don't vary in size and they're self propagating, so they don't decay over distance. So there's a little something extra. about the motor end plate that we looked at? The MEP is highly folded. And those are called junctional folds. And the purpose? More surface area. To increase the surface area. You said that um, instead of just saying depolarization of the sarcolemma, calling it actions of <laughs> also counts as extra. Not calling it would be. Well, extra, I mean, but actually, but to describe what NAP is, right. which you could do, uh, I would save that for the next part because we're going to pick it up with the action potential being generated at the sarcolemma, which we're half halfway there. So maybe at that point. And um, you also said that um, ACH receptors and those channels are part of. Um, yep. One Inter mm -hmm. Integrated protein. So you could mention that ACH receptors and the ligand gated non selective cation channels are part of the same integral protein. And a big one I've mentioned is um, why. 
have to say that there's more sodium influx than potassium. You don't have to explain why. If you were, what, what would you have to talk about to explain that? Because the equilibrium of um, sodium was, what was it, 65? Because sodium was 65 and passing was 94. So really the way to explain the increased sodium influx is to talk about equilibrium potentials. When you're at... Um, minus 85 millivolts, you're really close to potassium's equilibrium potential. So potassium has a small electrochemical gradient, and you're far from sodium's equilibrium potential, which gives sodium a very strong electrochemical gradient. So the EC gradient, as you approach the equilibrium potential, gets smaller and smaller and smaller until there is no EC gradient, and you are at equilibrium. But the further you move away from equilibrium, the EC gradient gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So I'm not fully explaining it, it's just a little shorthand. But verbally, right, that something about... You know, here's the, the e, ENA, here's the EK, here's where we are at rest, minus 85. You're close to this, you're far from that. This has a small, this has a large uh, electrochemical gradient. And if sodiums is really big and potassiums is really weak, a lot more sodium is going to come in and a lot less potassium is going to go up. Can I erase? Mm -hmm. So, if with the uh, equilibrium, like if I were to go ahead and explain on on the exam, can we just say the whole influx, influx, you know, exceeds the efflux due to, and then just go ahead and for the equilibrium and just name those steps instead of explaining the whole process. That would be enough, or you want actually the whole process, how it works and why is it? The more you put, the more potential points <laughs> is basically how it's going to work. There is no right or wrong, right? <laughs> it's all important, but you know how much of it you want to put in there is up to you. You can't. You, I mean, you you could just say sodium influx ex exceeds potassium efflux because sodium has a larger EC gradient, yeah. and potassium has a smaller EC yeah. gradient. Or you could take it a step further and explain why sodium has a larger and potassium has a smaller, in which case you need to talk about equilibrium potentials. But yeah, there's varying degrees of you know how much extra you want to put. If you just put my shorthand, you haven't explained anything. What does it mean if it's really close, it's really far? That's what you need to put in words. So minus 85 is the resting, is that rest? That, that's where we are right now at rest, exactly. Rest, uh, membrane potential, right? Resting membrane potential, yes, minus 85. Yeah. So is it correct to say that potassium has smaller EC gradient than the... Yes. A smaller EC gradient because we're closer to potassium's equilibrium potential. And sodium has a stronger EC gradient because we are further from sodium's equilibrium potential at minus 85 millivolts.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's another thing you could add there, and that is add the motor in plate once you've released ACH. ACH8 is in the motor in plate, and it will break down acetylcholine to end the signal. And that becomes the resting, right? To relax the muscle resting. For relaxation. Yeah. Yep. All right, so we left off with EPP reaches sarcolemma around the motor end plate, simulates opening the voltage-gated sodium channels. Bone color. Which results in... Depolarization of the sarcolemma. How do we want to get this? Um, Which leads to an action potential? There you go. There's the opportunity to add the process, the events of an action potential. So the depolarization phase, the repolarization phase, um, potassium efflux through voltage gated potassium channels for repol. And of course, we've already described depol due to sodium influx. You don't have to bring up the potassium channels, but if you want to explain what the action potential is, you could. And I had some slides that showed you the graph. And these are all FYI. Showing you where sodium channels open, the resulting depolarization, where potassium channels open, the resulting repolarization. Action potential and because we've talked about it enough I would say don't put spreads propagates because I think you, you have a general idea of what that means now. is another process you could get into if you want. And that's where along the length of the membrane you have one after another a series of voltage-gated sodium channels. So when you open that first batch of channels sodium comes in and spreads left and spreads right, it spreads far enough to trigger the next batch of channels to open, regenerating another action potential. And so that's really what propagation is. It's generating the action potential over and over and over again, each time moving like a, a millimeter or two down the membrane. But it's so fast, it in a you know, split second, travels the entire length of the sarcolemma and T-tubules. But again, before you start adding anything extra, get the basic steps down, because in the end that's worth more points. generally add a ton for this one. If the whole thing's worth 12, you're not going to get more than half of that back in, in extra. I don't think I've ever given more than maybe four or five points. 
but I haven't had anyone give me all the possible extras either. So, <laughs> but it's not it's not like you know each little extra piece is worth a point or two. Not necessarily. It depends. And also remember, and, and I remind you on the question itself on the exam, don't just put anything you think might be correct and related. Because incorrect information has got to lose points. I'm going to give extra for correct information. So this triggers something when the AP hits the T-tubule. <laughs> Simulating voltage, delta sign, triangle means change. Terminal cisternae. And this leads to calcium. Since the, the terms influx and efflux usually refer to in and out of a cell, this is in and out of an organelle. Maybe release would be better than efflux. Calcium uh, is released from TC, increasing cytosolic, myoplasmic, sarcoplasmic, calcium concentration, brackets means concentration. Calcium is really going to do, do two things. First, get the rest of the calcium released, and then all of it bind to troponin. So we can talk about getting it all released first, and then binding to troponin. So some of this calcium in turn binds to to the bryanodine receptors of the remaining calcium release channels. And again, just like at the motor end plate, the receptor, the channel, is one protein one integral protein in the membrane of the terminal cisterna. It's a channel that has a receptor on it. And it is called ryanodine receptor. And the channel is the calcium release channel. So we're talking about one protein. And this triggers opening. of these calcium release channels. A process called calcium, calcium induced calcium release. Positive feedback loop. A little extra.
Now, where is most of the calcium going? Most of the calcium diffuses through the cytosol and binds to the vesicle the TNC subunits of troponin. And that causes Out of or away from, off of, off of, out of its <laughs> inhibitory position, which is off of the myosin binding sites. Now, saying out of its inhibitory position means that. So, really, you could say either way. Off of the myosin binding sites on aptin or out of its inhibitory position. It really means the same thing. What does this do when you slide it off the binding sites? Allows for allows for myosin to bind to actin. Allows for binding. Exposing the hit. Myosin binding sites. Allowing myosin heads. To actin, to G actin, to the thin filament. So troponin changes shape, moves tropomyosin away from its inhibitory position. That exposes the myosin binding sites, allowing the myosin heads to bind to actin. Forming a cross forming a cross bridge, which is followed by a power stroke. followed by a cross bridge cycle. Either way, the next thing to do is explain a cycle. Each little step of one cross bridge cycle. Is that the same thing, then? the power stroke and the cross bridge cycle? Not really the same. The power stroke is a part of the cross bridge cycle. But really, just the, the point is that it's automatic. That as soon as the cross bridge forms, the power stroke occurs. There, there's no separate process that has to occur first. So 
maybe we can start the next line as the cross bridge cycle begins with detachment of PI from the Mycin More specific to mycin head, mycin ATPA, which is the binding site on the head. It is part of the head. Yes, the enzyme is embedded in the in the protein that forms the head. The crossbridge cycle begins with detachment of PI from the mycin ATPase. Exposing the mycin binding sites, allowing mycin heads to bind to actin. The crossbridge cycle begins with, you don't really have to put that in there, but it was just kind of leading into the next part. Is there a question? Question. Do you. Does that happen? No. Yes. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, next question. Yeah. <laughs> when we start to describe the crossbridge cycle, does it matter to you where we begin at? Because you taught us it's a loop. It doesn't really matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. But if you wanted to skip the kind of intro to the next phase and just start with you've exposed the myosin heads, the very next thing would be PI comes off. Well, cross bridge, PI comes off. So if we want to take this red part out, exposing the myosin heads on each other by two, acting, forming a cross bridge. Then we can skip that circled part. We've established the binding sites have been exposed, the cross bridge has formed, and now we're getting into the cycle. All right, so um, PI comes off the mycin ATPase, and then power uh, stroke takes place, yep. followed by a power stroke. Then detachment of ADP from the myosin ATPX. Can I erase the top? No. One second. Attachment of ADP from the mice and ATPX. You could say um, exposing the myosin or just allowing ATP to bind works too. I 
And even though it's kind of bullet point, I am putting in the words that kind of makes this flow, like, like it was a paragraph. As long as all the details are there, you don't necessarily have to do that. Exposing the mice and ATPs, allowing ATP to bind, triggering, detachment. Myosin head from actin. Followed by hydrolysis. used to recock the myosin head or re-energize the myosin head. So a little something you could add. It'll really be down. Yeah. Yeah. So the power stroke has occurred, ADP comes off. At this point, with the myosin, with the myosin head still attached to actin, you have a rigor state. Which is associated with rigor mortis. rigor mortis. And the cause of rigor mortis, the cause of a permanent rigor state, no ATP. Yeah. Upon death, cells no longer produce ATP. No ATP to bind to the head, it just does not detach. So you could talk a little bit about rigor mortis there. And it is called a, a rigor state, technically. Is, is that where it goes below the, on the graph? Is that, can you, is that show up on the graph, the rigor state? That's a graph of an action potential. Is that synonymous with like resting or below? I, I'm looking. You would have to look at a cross bridge cycle to see rigor state. Okay. Yeah. So right here. So when it's cocked and ready to go, it's in a high energy state. And then after it does the power stroke, it's in a low energy state. And that is rigor state. So is that synonymous with resting or is it different? No. Nope. It's different? Yep. Okay. At rest, there is no cross bridge form. Okay. Here you're stuck with cross bridges, but not, not detaching. But in a way it's synonymous though because nothing's moving, right? It's kind of like a stagnant period, period or moment, or no? Well, that's like saying rigor mortis is synonymous with relaxed muscle. Not really. Okay. But in terms of nothing's happening, not yet, nothing's happening. Okay. filament mechanism.
result in thin filaments sliding past thick moving the Z lines. Z discs, yep. Closer to the thick filaments. Shortening the sarcomeres. Last thing as sarcomere shorten. Myofibrils. Myofibers. Fascicles. Muscle organ shorten. That's contraction. And the point of contraction is to generate force or tension. So we don't have to do this for relaxation. Not necessarily write it out like this, but know the steps. Does that make sense? Yeah, but actually in this question. So steps include no more APs down axon terminal, no more release of ACH, breaking down ACH with ACHAs, no more APs generated of sarcolemma, all the way down to no more calcium being released. Sarcomeres connected and end in series. With cross bridge cycling, do all the myosin heads go through a power stroke simultaneously? So you can talk about how at any given moment, while half are going through a power stroke and connected, half are re-energizing and getting ready for the next one. So there's always a hand on the rope, so to speak. You never let go of the rope and let the, the thin filament slide back to the starting position. Typically, when you're generating tension, you are opposing a force of some kind, unless you're in space. If you're on the ground, at least you've got gravity pulling on the bones. So even if I'm doing a bicep curl with nothing in my hand, I, I still have to overcome the weight of my forearm. And so that opposing force is always trying to stretch the sarcomeres. And the cross bridge cycling is trying to shorten the sarcomeres. So if all the heads grabbed, slid, let go at the same time, the load would overcome 
the lack of resistance in that moment and then slide you back to where you started. So it's not like there's anything inside the sarcomere pulling the, the thin filaments back to the starting position. It would be the load, the force opposing contraction that would pull it back. And what's the consequence uh, for your muscles being in space for several weeks or months? Atrophy. Atrophy. There's just no stress. Hard for those guys to even just walk when they come back down. Although now they have them exercise, little resistance training things. Like an ab roller. Yeah. <laughs> Create some sort of resistance. I think it's probably easier to work out there. Well, yeah, the weights, obviously, no gravity point on the weights, but you, it would be like something spring-loaded. Yeah. So that's why I was thinking of, like, the little device where you, or the thigh master device, you know? Because mm -hmm. spring resistance is spring resistance anywhere. It's not dependent on gravity. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, weights wouldn't work so well. You could bench press anything. It just flows. Right? Got to get a picture of it, though, when you got a thousand pounds. But on even it. just, like, <laughs> doing sit-ups or something will probably be easier. Yeah. What's a motor unit? A motor neuron and all the fibers it innervates. How are large motor units different from small? More fiber? 